in the name of the Lord. If you would please stand, we'll start with our first hymn today, the triumphal entry of 221, Hosanna, loud Hosanna. <laughs> from the Gospel of Matthew in chapter 21 and also the Gospel of Luke in chapter 19 on this Palm Sunday. And the Bible says, As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, see, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while other cut branches from the tree and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest heaven! When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. And all of his children said this morning, Amen. We thank God for those precious verses. We thank God for another Lord's Day he's given us to come together this morning. I'm so thankful for each and every one of you that are here today. May God truly and richly bless our worship this morning. If you are a first-time guest with us, we encourage you. There's a couple ways you can touch base with us. One, there's a little tear-out section in the bulletin. You can fill that out. 
drop it in the offering plates as they're passed by here after a while, or you can hand it to somebody and they'll get it to us however you see fit, or you can just simply text the word welcome uh, to the number you see there, 859-986-3444. But we're glad that you are a guest today, and we're thankful again for each and every one of you on this Lord's Day. I would encourage you also to look and keep up to date with what's going on in the church. And, uh, and on April 16th, uh, I'll be starting a new series with your new Sunday school series. I'll be preaching as you study in your small group classes about dealing with temptation. And then also that Sunday night, the week after Easter, on Sunday night, we're going to meet in the fellowship hall, very relaxed atmosphere. And I'm going to do a special uh, series or studies for several weeks uh, about getting to know and to understand your Bible better. So I hope that uh, you'll benefit from that and that you'll come out and be with us on that day. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, as you enter Jerusalem with the people praising you that day, may your presence here this morning be with us as the shepherd of our hearts, as the king of our lives here today, as we lift our voices to praise your name. Come and rule our lives. Come and be blessed by our praise. Come and be our Savior. Come be our Lord. Come to us, O Lord, and bring peace that we so desperately need. Comfort that many so desperately long for. Bring strength to those who are weak, Heavenly Father, those who are hurting. Bring courage to those who are scared. Bring grace, Lord, as we all need grace. Bring healing to the bodies of those, Heavenly Father and mercy as only you can. Even so, come Lord Jesus this morning. Amen.
Alaska is cold. Alaska has dark winters. And never in a million years did I think that I would be in a church planting role. But we arrived in Alaska early 2019 to take the helm at True North. We think about the strain it puts on planters to move their family here, to endure the darkness, to live in the cold. In the same way that it's hard for people to move here, to live here, it's really challenging for churches to thrive here. I got a taste of that the first time that I met Russ Mabry. Russ was the last and youngest deacon at Muldoon Road Baptist Church at 82 years old. The last few years that we've had uh, declining population, we did not have the funds to bring a, a, a pastor up in lieu of a call uh, or to move him and his family up here. The only viable option that I saw was, uh, was, was the potential of merger. He explained to me that Muldoon Road, though it had been thriving in its history, the baton was never passed. And Muldoon Road and True North were different really in every way. But we decided to become one church, to begin to pass that baton and really bring up the next generation of faithful believers. We are a healthier, more mature, but also more agile, lively, and ready to go church than either of those previous churches could have been on their own. God's always brought young men to us. I sort of think it's the rugged wilderness of Alaska. We need to find pockets of darkness in our city and in our state where there is no gospel light, train those young men, get behind them with resources, and then send them to do the work of the church. Without the generous giving of Southern Baptists, church plants can't survive. We need the faithful partnership of Southern Baptists in the lower 48 states. I never want to undersell that this is a hard place, but this is what passing the baton looks like. It looks like an older generation being willing to trust that the next generation of the church will carry the light of the gospel to the people who need it. I stand before you in, uh, in Paula's shoes again today. She's not feeling well, been dealing with something for a couple of weeks, still can't get through the coughing and fever and things of that nature. But I do want to encourage you uh, to continue to give to the Annie Armstrong Easter offering for North American missions. What you give is making a difference. We give a percentage each week uh, from our offerings, a small percentage, but when we take these special offerings, 100% of that goes directly to the missionaries on the field, building relationships and doing things like uh, helping other churches merge with churches so that the worship of Christ will go forward, as you saw in that very video. I want to thank you for your giving. Uh, our goal is 1500 We're not far from that now. We'll continue with this offering through next Sunday through Easter. And may the Lord bless you as you give with faith and joy. Amen, amen. If you would please, can, uh, we'll continue in our worship. If you would please stand in your hymnal. It will be 285, I Will Sing of My Redeemer.
Jesus at your holy table, I come. <laughs> out the plates but if you feel more comfortable there are little white slips in your all's pew and there's a little white church in the back if you'd rather give that way um, as well we also have our church center app and our website and if you'd like to mail it you can more than welcome to mail it to us as well let's go ahead and let's bow our heads and ask a blessing for this morning's offering dear heavenly father i thank you for this day you've given us lord I thank you for all that you've done for us father I thank you for taking on human flesh and, <clears throat> and coming into this world, Father, being our high priest, taking the burden and the pain of what it is to, to walk in this sinful world, Lord, but not knowing sin. Lord, we are thankful for what you've done. But today we reflect on that with Palm Sunday, crying out, Hosanna in the highest, what you've done for us. Lord, let this offering be a blessing unto you let it be the hands and feet of your kingdom lord let it hide alan behind the cross as he gets the message today let his words be your words be with joan as he sings 
May the praise and glory only go to you, Father, as it should. As it's all in your son's righteous and holy name. Amen. Jesus walked in days of long ago. I wandered down each path he knew with reverent step and slow. Those little lanes they have not changed. A sweet peace fills the air. I walk today where Jesus walked and felt his presence there. My pathway led through Bethlehem Ah, memories ever sweet The little hills of Galilee That knew those childish The Mount of Olives hollowed scenes that Jesus knew before. I saw the mighty Jordan roll as in the days of yore. I knelt today where Jesus knelt, where all alone he prayed. The garden of Gethsemane, my heart felt unafraid. I paid my heavy burden up and with him by my side I climb the hill of Calvary I climb the hill of Calvary I climb the hill of Calvary where on the cross he died. I walked today where Jesus walked 
and felt him close to me. The Lord's earnest desire. I'm going to read this morning verses 1 through 15 of the Gospel of Luke in chapter 22. And for a few moments before we partake of the Lord's Supper, with this thought of the words that he spoke to his apostles in that upper room on that night of the Passover, the Lord's earnest desire. By the time we come to these verses that we're about to read, the triumphal entry uh, into Jerusalem had already happened. The temple had been cleansed by Jesus Christ. Prophecies had been made and teachings from Jesus had been shared in these final few days of what we refer to as Passion Week of his life. Even a fig tree had been cursed by Christ and had withered and died. And at this time now Jesus is with his disciples and they're in an upper room celebrating the Passover with them before he would be arrested and hung upon a cross. That being said, let's read God's Word, Luke chapter 22, verses 1 through 15. And the Bible says, Now the feast of unleavened bread drew near, which is called the Passover. And the chief priest and the scribes were seeking how to put him to death, for they feared the people. Then Satan entered into Judas called Iscariot, who was of the number of the twelve. He went away and conferred with the chief priests and officers how he might betray him to them. And they were glad and agreed to give him money. So he consented and sought an opportunity to betray him to them in the absence of a crowd. Then came the day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. So Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us, that we may eat it. They said to him, Where will you have us prepare it? He said to them, Behold, when you have entered the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him into the house that he enters. And tell the master of the house, the teacher says to you, Where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room, furnished. Prepare it there. And they went and found it just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. And when the hour came, he, being Jesus, reclined at table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. May God bless the reading of his word today. What a thought that Jesus desired to share this Passover with them because he was about to suffer greatly for God's glory and for mankind's redemption. You know, on a personal note, as we gather around the Lord's table this morning in a few moments, uh, Partaking of this Lord's Supper, I think, still today helps prepare us for suffering in life and the struggles that we must face in this life. Again, after Jesus and the disciples had gathered together around the Passover table, Jesus spoke those words, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. You see, as Jesus is about to enter into a time of horrific suffering in his life, he wanted to be with those that had been closest to him for some three years now. And this desire is even more remarkable when you consider the imperfections of the disciples, in which are on display for all to see in the events following the supper in Luke chapter 22. The disciples uh, didn't seem to be a great help to the Lord during this time, to be honest with you. For example, Jesus tells them about his coming suffering and his coming death, and they don't seem to be moved to understand that or grasp that or to care for him or to be sympathetic with his words. They're more concerned about, well, who's going to betray you in verse 23? It goes beyond that. This is immediately following that. There's a dispute among 
of the disciples that arose as to which of them would be considered the greatest in the kingdom. They're worrying about who's going to be the top dog. That's in verses 24 through 30 of the same chapter. He later, as he goes into Gethsemane and he's praying, he later asks them to pray that they might not enter into temptation while he is alone in prayer with the Father, and instead they're sleeping. They can't even stay up with him to, to pray with him. That's in verses 39 through 46. And then, of course, in verses 47 and 48, we see Judas betray him with that kiss. And we also see in verses 54 through 62, then Peter denies him. After Peter had denied that he would deny him. You know, I thought this week, we could ask, couldn't Jesus have found better, more mature people to spend this last Passover with. And yet, this came to my mind. If I'm going to consider that, if I'm going to ask that, Lord, couldn't you have found some better disciples to spend your last few hours before you go to the cross with? If I'm going to consider that, then I have to ask this. Can't Jesus find better, more loyal people to partake of the Lord's Supper with today? And I say that not to be judgmental towards you. I say that because I know he can certainly do better than me. Jesus knew who his disciples were. As a matter of fact, Jesus proved that night as he told them all that was going to happen. He proved that night that he knew these men better than they knew themselves. He knew their weaknesses, and he knew their faults, and he knew ahead of time that they would run, that they would deny, that they would betray. He knew all of that ahead of time. It was no surprise to Jesus Christ. And yet he still desired to be with them before he would suffer and die. And just as he knew about uh, all of the disciples' lives and what would happen that night, what would transpire. He knows about Alan's life as well, and he knows about your life also. He too knows, yes, your strengths and your gifts and your talents, but he also knows your weaknesses and your sins and your shortcomings. And yet, and yet, Jesus still desires to have fellowship with us. Ah, what a thought. What a thought. Even in our faults, even in our failures, even in our weaknesses, even in how our minds have wandered this morning in a precious time of worship, what a heartwarming and inspiring thought that Jesus is still saying, I desire to have fellowship with you. My people, I know you. It's obvious that the disciples needed Jesus in some serious ways as we all do still today. And yet on some level, on some level, Jesus needed the disciples that night. I'm not saying he couldn't have done it without them, but at least he wanted them to be with him in this place of struggle and pain. He desired for them to be with them and for he to be with them. Let me share something with you that might be hard to hear. You don't impress Jesus. I don't impress Jesus. We don't impress Jesus. E even in our finest hour, when I think I've nailed it, the Christian life, we don't impress Jesus with our goodness. We can please Jesus, and you have done that today. We can bless the name of Jesus Christ, and we have done that this morning. We can glorify Him, and I pray you've done that through obedience, but impress God? No. No. We can bless Him and please Him and love Him and honor Him, but impress Him? No. And yet I still think there are some people who stick that chest out and strut like an old banny rooster and think, God must be pretty proud of me. But we don't impress God. Impressing God, the reason I say that, isn't the basis for our relationship with God. And, and I thank God for that. That my relationship with God isn't bound to whether I impress Him that day or at that moment or not. 
And so it was for the disciples. He knew them. He knew their weaknesses. He knew what was going to happen. And yet he still desired to fellowship with them that night that he'd be betrayed. Jesus didn't want to be with the disciples because of the depth of their knowledge or their maturity in the faith, but rather he longed to be with them with all their flaws and defects because they were his. They belonged to him. And Jesus said that in the high priestly prayer. You've given them to me. And he loved them. And you know what? Except for Judas, they loved him to a degree that they were capable of doing so at that time. And their love would grow. Their obedience would grow. Especially at the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit would fill their lives. But I'm thankful that impressing God is not the basis for our relationship, but that the basis for our, my relationship with Him is that I'm His by grace and through faith. He loves me, and I love Him to the degree that I'm capable of doing at this point in my life. And I find it immensely comforting and quite astounding to know that Jesus actually wants to be with me in all my perfections, imperfections, in all my weaknesses, and in all my failures. What a grace. What an awesome, inspiring thought. <laughs> there are still those that betray him. There are still others that deny him. There are still some who we like to wonder who is the most mature and the greatest in the church among ourselves. <laughs> There are still some of us who will run scared when any opposition comes our way in the Christian life. Nothing's changed there. And yet, Jesus still desires for us to get together around this table and by faith fellowship with one another, the tie that binds us together, and also to fellowship with Him. Remembering His body, that he gave and the blood that he shed in the new covenant for my salvation and your salvation. So when we celebrate the Lord's Supper, we regularly hear the words, this is my body given for you. And I thank God for that. Do this in remembrance of me, he said. And this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. We hear those words too. I just want to say, as we move forward in this service today, let these truths encourage you today. Let them challenge you today. Allow them to change you today and to strengthen your relationship with Christ. Remember, you and I are saved not by our goodness, not by our merit, but we are saved by the grace of God found only in the person of Jesus Christ and what he did at Calvary's cross. You're not going to impress him today with what you do, but you can sure draw near to fellowship and please him. And he please you as you fellowship with him in this way. We come to, get, to remember today that Jesus most certainly gave his body for all of us and he willingly poured out his blood for all of us. He lovingly sacrificed all for each one of us today. And so allow that to motivate us to recognize the eternal value of enjoying His presence and more closely be looking and listening for what He is saying while we gather around the table of the Lord today. Listen for His voice. Enjoy His presence. Be thankful that He still desires to partake of this with you. You see, the Lord desires to spend these moments with you right now on the Lord's day. Isn't that great? He desires for you to know God and to have fellowship with Him. He wants that today. 
And so how will that change how you look at what we're doing here this morning? These truths. How will that influence or impact your thinking as we move forward in this service? Will, will this help you see that coming to the Lord's table is, is, listen, it is much, much more than just a religious ceremony. It, it, it is fellowshipping with God through faith in the sacrifice and the person of Jesus Christ. It's saying, in all my faults and failures, I cling to your body, I cling to the blood for my salvation. I come to you today, O oh Lord, trusting in your name, trusting in what you've done. I'm not trying to impress you. I'm not trying to outdo anybody else. I just come to you as I am, just as I am without one plea but that thy blood was shed for thee. Jesus, I come. Jesus, I come. It is my prayer that we most certainly do draw near to him today and that we remember what he has done for us in his life, in his death, in his burial, and in his resurrection. And may we remember that he has an earnest desire to fellowship with you this Lord's Day morning. So don't let this moment just pass you by. Don't just rush through it. May we remember what he has done so that we can do at this very hour. He's made this hour possible. He's made this time of fellowship and worship possible by what he's done for you. He's made this moment sacred through what He has done for us. And so as we gather today, may we remember His body offered up and His blood shed for our cleansing so that we most assuredly can fellowship in the good news of Jesus Christ today. Amen. Now before we partake of this supper, it is sacred, it is beautiful, it is precious. But it should be entered into with awe and reverence and a seriousness because we are meeting with Jesus. And so I pray that you will reflect upon your life. And Before we partake, we're going to offer a hymn of invitation. If there's anything in your life, any decision that you need to make today before we move forward in this service, I will be down at the side to pray with you. The altar will be open if you just need to come and get alone with God and draw near unto Him and pray to Him. Whatever it is, as we sing this hymn of invitation, but prepare your hearts, whether you do it standing where you're at in singing or whether you come to this altar. Prepare your hearts as we begin to enter into this time of fellowship with our Lord through the ordinance of the Lord's Supper. Let's stand together and sing. Waiting for 